Yeah! There's a symbol so tied to America. We all own a piece of it. America's lived its life in jeans. Blue jeans. Levi's blue jeans. Blue jeans sort of become a metaphor for America itself, especially Levi's. And although Levi's is not a Dior or a Chanel, its importance in the history of fashion is probably at least as great. But one historian aims to follow the thread of this riveting story, to find out just how Levi's became woven into the fabric of America. January 2001, an evidence room in San Francisco. Work to unlock a mystery begins. An expert's brought in, meticulous in her forensics, her search for clues. To crack the case, she must decode these blue jeans. As Levi Strauss and Company's historian, only Lynn Downey knows how to read them. The threads will keep their secrets, offering no hint of their importance. But Lynn knows the smoking gun, the tell-all DNA of these pants, lies right in front of her. These are not a pair of 501 jeans. It's a very simple pair of men's denim work pants. Her mission is to answer if these Levi's are the oldest known pair of blue jeans. It's solving a mystery, and it's part of my job to fill in those blanks. And could these Levi's, a type Lynn has never seen before, shed light on the history of jeans? Can they offer hints of how humble work pants became an American icon? The year is 1853. The American West is still wild. Transcontinental railroads are merely an idea. And the 49ers are heading to California's gold mines to find their fortune. Levi Strauss comes to San Francisco too, aiming to set up the West Coast branch of his family's New York dry goods business and hoping to cash in on the gold rush. Mining is back-breaking work, and it wears on clothing. A tailor named Jacob Davis sees the need for industrial strength pants. So Jacob is trying to think of a way to make the pants stronger when he looked at a horse blanket that he had in his shop. And the points of strain on this horse blanket were reinforced with metal rivets. So he thought, well, I'll put some metal rivets in these pants and see if they hold up. Well, they did. Davis knows he's onto something. He approaches his supplier, Levi Strauss, with an idea. And he suggested to Levi that this would be a great invention to patent, but he didn't have the $68 uh, to file the patent papers. So he said, if you'll put up the money, uh, I'll let you be my half partner in this and we'll take out the patent together. Levi says yes. And on May 20th, 1873, less than a decade after the Civil War ended, Jacob Davis and Levi Strauss jointly are granted the patent for the world's first jeans. Quickly, people started talking about those pants of Levi's, which is why we call them Levi's today. The rest would have been history if not for the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The city by the bay tumbles down, including Levi Strauss and Company headquarters. Years of historical design records and garments are destroyed. Our offices were reduced to rubble, so we lost a lot of our history. They've been trying to retrieve that lost information ever since. Evidence from these blue jeans will help. Lynn's been commissioned by an auction house to verify the age of these jeans. The pants are headed for eBay to be sold to the highest bidder. If they're the oldest known pair of jeans, there's no telling how high prices could go. It's a big job, and Lynn has little to go on, other than knowing the pants came from Nevada. Lynn's trained eye deduces these Nevada jeans survived decades in a garbage dump. 
there are some very round rust stains on one of the legs, on the back, and also on the front. Also, this bleaching, this sort of tie-dye effect, is what happens when you expose fabric to water and chemicals. With the where of the mystery solved, she looks to answer when. When were these jeans made? One big clue, there's only one back pocket. After 1901, all Levi's carried two pockets on the back. But the real key to telling us how old this pair of pants is, is the actual rivets themselves. Early on, Levi Strauss displayed his patent date, 1873, right on the rivet. But when the patent expired in 1890, the date came off the pants. These rivets have the date, so we know they're before 1890. They're probably the 1880s. This is the smoking gun, the irrefutable evidence proving these genes are older than any known pair. A find like this comes once in a lifetime. There's no telling how many more secrets they hide. Lynn knows the Levi's archives should be these genes' rightful home. As soon as I saw those pants, I was very professional on the outside. And on the inside, I was screaming, those are my pants. Because I knew we had to bid on these pants and get them for the archives. She joins the bidding and hangs on for the ride. At the very, very last minute and a half, the last 30 seconds, it bounced from 25,000 to 40,000. And we were the winners for $46,532. And I did not sleep that night. I've never had so much adrenaline going through my body. <laughs> After the adrenaline had worn off, another case. This one starts right at home with a pair of waist overalls at Levi headquarters. It's a case gone cold for more than 80 years. The year is 1920, just three years after World War I. Woodrow Wilson is running the country, but Al Capone is running Chicago. In San Francisco, a box arrives at Levi's headquarters. In it, a note and a ratty pair of 501 jeans. It was from this man named Homer Campbell, and he had sent these pants back to us in 1920 because he felt they hadn't held up. I purchased these overalls in the early part of 1917 and I have worn them every day except Sunday since that time. And for some reason, which I wish you would explain, they've gone to pieces. Please consider this and let me know if the fault is mine. Homer Campbell. The genes are curious. Patches from waistband to hem add to the intrigue. And we thought, wow, these pants must have really fallen apart for him to need to, to put these patches all over them. The search for answers brings only questions. There's nothing wrong with the pants under all of these patches. This is padding. This guy, this Homer Campbell guy, covered the upper thigh and his, the seat of his pants with padding. And that brings up another clue. Why would Homer need padding? What type of life did he lead? Homer mentions that he'd bought his pants in Wickenburg, Arizona, but he offers no details about himself or his profession, heightening the mystery. The fact that I didn't know anything about Homer Campbell, I didn't have a response in my files of letters, made me understand that this was a piece of a puzzle that needed to be solved. The case is definitely the opportunity of a lifetime. In the early 1900s, Wickenburg's main industries are gold mining and ranching. Was Homer a miner or a rancher? Based on a hole in the right back pocket, we surmise that he might have been a farrier because of the kind of tool that you need to use to clean a horse's hoof. Maybe he kept putting it in his back pocket and wearing it through. Lynn is driven to unlock the mystery, especially after finding Homer's obituary. It opened up the possibility that Homer was a miner, not a farrier. The only way to find the truth Hit the road for Arizona. To go there is simply to give me the sense of satisfaction as a historian that I followed every lead to the very, very last place it has to be. And I'll know inside myself that I've done everything I need to do to learn about Homer. <laughs>